Welcome back to Cocktails and Classics. My name is Dylan. Joining me as always are Ben and Cam. And this week we did 1985's Clue. Kind of a cult classic comedy mystery, I guess. Uh, it's a movie based on the board game Clue. And to kick everything off and get everybody in the right mood, we're going to take to this week's cocktail. And Ben found us this week's cocktail again. Doing doing the work. Doing God's work here. Cocktails and classics. Um, by that I mean I did a quick Google search and found what I could make at home. So, this week's cocktail is the Colonel Mustard. It is one ounce of gin, two ounces of lime juice... An ounce and a half of peach brandy, a dash of spicy Dijon mustard, and uh, you add all of those ingredients and some honey into a shaker, strain it into a glass, and then you can garnish it with lime and mint. It's very good. It's alcohol forward. I didn't use as much honey as I probably should have. That's on me. Uh, I would recommend going a little bit more. I just kind of went like... I don't know. I used a squeeze bottle because, you know, I'm a, not some sort of fancy boy who probably has some sort of glass bottle honey shit. Um, so I gave it two good good squeezes from uh, the honey bear and shook oh, it up. Oh, God, the honey bear's the worst. <laughs> it's not even actual probably honey. <clears throat> really? It's not honey? I mean, it's very low, low-grade honey. Uh there's a pretty good Netflix documentary about uh, what is that? What is that called? All right. Well, I looked that up. Ben, uh, how's the mustard in there? That seems kind of like an interesting uh, ingredient. I mean, it's there. It's not like super. Like I was kind of worried, but it. I don't want to say, you know, like how you're worried when you put an egg white in a cocktail that it's gonna be kind of like it's gonna give it that weird kind of texture. Yeah. That was my biggest fear. Um No, it it, it doesn't it kinda of just kinda of mixes throughout. I mean you get a little bit of the of like the mustard flavor through it, and because it's a Dijon, even then, it's not like super you know, strong stadium mustard throughout, but it's just kind of a note of it. It's not like it's not super like that strong. mustard we got in uh, Denver. That was no, too mustardy. No, um, and because you just, I mean, you only add like a, I mean, I literally just like a, a little, little dollop of it, not a lot, um, just because I didn't want it to be super mustardy. But I mean, I guess it really depends. You, you could, it calls for a dash. Depends how hard and fast or loose you want to play with the wording of a dash you could go with a big dash you could go with a little tiny dash you know you do you most of what i'm getting is a lot of uh because of the gin like the flavor of gin is kind of a little bit more powerful i feel Mm -hmm. like that's what i'm like the juniper is mostly like what's coming through um and then because i garnish with the mint at the end i'm still getting a little bit of mint coming through pretty strong too um, the Netflix series I was talking about is Rotten. It reveals, it travels deep into the heart of the food supply chain to reveal unsavory truths and explode, uh, expose hidden forces that shape what we eat. So there's one on like honey, peanuts, garlic, chicken, milk, cod. There's a couple seasons, but the honey one kind of explains that like typically the honey bears is like the lowest form of honey and it's like cut with uh, like corn syrup or something. So it's like not actual honey. Then I think the garlic one talks about like why you shouldn't get peeled, like pre-peeled garlic because people just use like their teeth and their feet and shit. Yum. But uh, check the show notes below. Get yourself some ingredients to make a kernel mustard. Uh, You'll get some gin and I doubt they're going to have a Dijon mustard. So you might have to supply that one yourself, but um, (laughs) they might have the peach brandy though. True. Uh, check out clue on prime video as of recording i think it's got less than 14 days once this drops so if you want to watch along uh, i'd hurry up and check it out clue is a 1985 uh comedy crime mystery currently sits at a 7.2 out of 10 on imdb 
directed by Jonathan Lynn, written by John Landis and Jonathan Lynn. It's the story of six guests who are anonymously invited to a strange mansion for dinner, but after their host is killed, they must cooperate with the staff to identify the murderer as the bodies pile up. It stars Eileen Brennan, Tim Curry, Madeline Kahn, Christopher Lloyd, Michael McKean, Martin Mull. I feel like this had a lot of people that would be like, it's a cast of, I mean, a couple of big names, and then a lot of people that you're, you'll go, oh, I've seen them before. I've seen them in something. Um, especially if you've watched, like, older television, you'll be like, oh my god, I've seen them in, in something. Um, for example, The Cook was a nurse on MASH. She was in, like, 170-ish or close to that many episodes of, of MASH. Like, she was in the entire show. I didn't realize who Martin Mull was at the time. I kept... He looked familiar, but I couldn't place him. And I wouldn't have based off of what he looks like now. But if you've seen Arrested Development, he's Gene Parmesan. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Which, like, I wouldn't have put it together because <laughs> now, like, when you see a picture of him now and he's got, like, the gray beard and everything, like, that's what I think of when I hear his name. I don't think of him with just a mustache and I don't think of what he looks like as a younger guy. I just always imagined he's <laughs> he's looked like that. <laughs> I was going to say like looking at an updated picture of him it really makes like I'm like oh shit okay. Yeah, I didn't recognize him but when I looked at the picture on IMDb I was like, "Oh my god, that was him?" Huh. I I wouldn't have put it I would not have put it together. Um Michael Michael McKean who was uh in I can't think of the movie. Spinal Tap. This is Spinal Tap. Yeah. Um, I feel like quite a few of the actors have been in... I mean, I don't think we've done a Tim Curry movie, but Christopher Lloyd. We, uh... I, I know on the list is uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mrs. White did a lot of uh, Mel Brooks movies. Young Frankenstein. She was in Blazing Saddles. Another one that's on the list, but maybe we will, maybe we won't do it because uh, we're walking a fine line. Yeah, I feel like they went to, like, the well of comedy actors for the, the main cast, and then everyone else, they were like, oh, let's find some background players who have done a bunch of different things. Had anyone seen this before? I don't think so. I, had I think seen... I had seen bits and pieces, maybe, but... Wait, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> How do you... How do you think so? Well, it's like, I don't know. Like, maybe it was on TV once, but I don't really remember any of it. And I didn't really remember any of the endings, so. I remember this being on HBO once as a kid. And turning on, like, the last, I don't remember how many minutes of the movie. And, spoiler, I, I, obviously, uh, this is what we do here. We talk about the movie, so we're going to spoil it here. I had remembered seeing... Something in the ending where there were, like... I remember seeing two different versions of how it ended. And in my head, I thought there was just, like, four or five. And they never really explained what the actual ending was. They just kind of left it at, like, here's all the possible outcomes of what would have happened. So when I watched it again and saw the ending and then where there was actually the one that said, here's what really happened, I was like, oh, thank God. They actually do give you a... They actually do give you a what actually happened. Here. Well, the so the interesting thing about that though is that when they played this in the theater, they only played one of the three endings, and it kind of depended on which one you saw. Hmm. I wish movies did that. I think that's a cool, very sweet idea. Like you go and see a movie, and you're like, "Oh, the ending, crazy, right?" And they're like, "Wait, what? No, that's <laughs> not the ending I saw." The ending where they all did it was fucking nuts, right? And you're like, "What?" What? No. Wait, no. what? Miss Scarlet did it. She did all of it. Yeah. What? So each of those were all equally valid endings, depending on which theater you saw it at in 1985. I wonder if that actually went over well, though. Like, I know we think the concept is cool, but I wonder if it, like, actually... Especially pre-internet, I feel like that's a pretty sweet word-of-mouth marketing campaign. But it does, like... It makes sense, though, because, like, you know, it's based off the board game, so it's, like... Yeah. Oh, the board game has multiple different endings. Like, you know, it could be different every time. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it's a little weird 
when you watch all of them back to back to back. It is interesting. I was wondering, because I, I knew that about the movie. So when I was watching it, I was like, what ending do they play on here? And turns out the answer is all three of them. I think the last one is definitely the most interesting of them. But that they all did it? That they all, like, each of them did it. And one of them was, like, part of the FBI or whatever. <laughs> and all, well, And also the added twist of the butler actually being Mr. Body rather than... You know the guy who died. It was so ridiculous the the uh, when they all did it ending because it's like it's the quiet like um, the politician <coughs> who was like oh like I'm a homosexual and I don't want anyone to find out and then like the very last line of the movie is yeah and I'm going home to sleep with my wife you're just like fuck me come on yeah <laughs> really <laughs> come on that's how he ended. <laughs> I expected a David Caruso yeah scream at the end. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Won't get fooled again. And I got a clue. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, I mean, I think in general it was pretty entertaining, but it was just so fucking corny. Like, when he was like, oh, I brought you all something, and he brings them all, like, a candle, like, all the weapons, you know, and they're opening the weapons from the board game. It's just like, oh, fuck, come on, Jesus. Yeah, and they're like, the letters, it's like, your your code name is Mr. Plum, and we're only going to use those code names. That one's at least a little more believable. It's just this guy brought a bunch of weapons, and one of, it was well, like, hey, you get a candlestick, he, you get a rope, he, Did he Plum's going to get a gun. Did he bring them, or was that his house? No, he brought them. Yeah, that was I Mr. Body brought them. Place. His his plan was which the which makes the third ending not really make sense. But his plan was basically to say, "Hey, uh, if you kill whoever kills this butler guy, uh, you know, um, whoever kills this butler guy, I don't remember what he said, but." Basically, one person goes down instead of all of you going down. Yeah. And uh, and no one's going to know who did it. Right. Which really doesn't and, make sense because if they just... I mean, I guess technically they like would find out because they'd be like, he's been blackmailing us, but like, I don't know. It's still just one person going down, but I guess your dirty laundry doesn't get exposed. Right. Well, that's what, what I love is the guy about. who's get who gets handed like a revolver, and it's like, yeah, yeah. they'll never know who did it. <laughs> well, if the right. guy dies of a bullet wound, obviously like, we're gonna know who did it. Yeah, or like one was a rope. It's like, all right, you're gonna strangle him. Yeah, like a rope. It is funny too, like the severity. Like it's like, like oh yeah, pipe? you get a candlestick, you get a pipe, you get a wrench, pipe, wrench, candlestick, you get a fucking like, okay. gun, blunt, blunt object, blunt force. Okay. Early night, early to mid nineteen eighties. Maybe you get away with it, you know. But again, at the same even time, earlier than that, right? There's like, also there's also going to be blood. Oh yeah, I think it, they said the movie took place in like the. I feel like it'd be like sixties or something. Yeah, I feel like they said the movie took place in like the fifty. I think it was like, nineteen fifty four. It might. Yeah, that sounds at least closer because it's like because they're dealing with like you know, red scare, communism yeah. type stuff. But also, Hoover. like, oh, whoever's holding the bloody object is probably the killer. I mean, the whole yeah, premise pretty is big, pretty flawed. Pretty big flaw in the plan. I mean, the whole but thing's really flawed. once you get past flawed. that, once you get past that. I mean, one of the things I'm kind of annoyed is I feel like, I, I didn't go back and look, but I feel like, I feel like a good whodunit movie, you should be able to rewind the film and go back and be like, oh, the clues were there. I just didn't notice them at the time. But I feel like that was not true in this movie at no, all. No, they were. Well, they explained it all they to were. you. They were. when Yeah, when he explains it all to you, all that stuff happened. Okay. Like when um, when she mentions the, the recipe, like, oh, this oh, is yeah. my favorite mm -hmm. recipe, she does say that early in the movie. Well, but uh, the, you do see Mrs. White and Evelyn like, kind of run into one. Were they really not there though? Like I don't know. I guess I didn't now, go see, back and watch like the tape. I feel like that's tricky but... to do. I feel like they can't do that because of the fact that they did three endings, right? That's what I'm saying. Is like, yeah, they did multiple endings, but because I feel like I was kind of looking for that. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like I was kind of being like, okay, who's not here, or whatever. And I didn't really see anyone that stood out that was like, oh, 
So and so is obviously not here right now. Yeah, I did like though that they pointed out like the motive slash like oh here's the reasoning that this person would know x y or z yeah you know you'd have the oh uh colonel mustard like they you see the picture of the the stranded automo automotist what do they call what do they list that guy as motorist motorist jesus christ completely blanked there um the stranded motorist ended up being colonel mustard's like driver in the military uh, like I said, the throwaway line about the, this being her favorite, Mrs. White's favorite mm. recipe. Um, or Mrs. Peacock says that Mrs. White kind of shudders also, when she sees casually eating Evelyn. Brains. Wait, who was, the, who was the one that wasn't there? Well, it depends on the scene. There was one where it was like Mr. Plum wasn't for there. The, for the Professor cook. Plum wasn't there or something. Because how many, how many of them are there? There's six. Six. Plus the butler. Oh, well, then, and then also Yvette. Well, then they're all there, actually. Right. That's what I'm saying, is I feel like in a lot of these scenes, it's kind of like... The one that makes the most sense is when Yvette kills two of them. And then... Uh, what was it? Scarlet then kills her? That's the one that makes the most sense to me. Like... Yeah. Because Yvette's... Like, that's the most plausible. Well, yeah, because... Again, Colonel Mustard and her split up, so, like, even though you technically see what she does in that room, then there's, like, the whole gap of them just not being together, so it would make sense she'd have the right the time in, to move around. And there were, she was literally not in the rooms when, you know, people died or whatever. As someone who had never seen this and didn't really know what to expect going in, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, like Cam said, it is pretty corny, and there is a lot of, like... I, not necessarily like corny humor, but like I feel like easy humor. There's a like, lot of corny humor. I like, mean, like where they're like running back and forth between the rooms. Like oh, that was so end. funny. Like that's <laughs> it's funny, but it's also very corny. So, yeah. um, or like you know, like everyone looking at like Yvette's like cleavage. I'm like okay, all right. But I do I think... love the corny joke where they just like slowly shut the door in people's faces where the guy is like no oh, yeah. and then just like slowly closes the door. Like there was a lot of humor in this where I, I was like gave a hearty chuckle out loud. I was like I was like, Alright, that's that's a funny joke, you know. <laughs> like just looking through like back through some of the quotes where it's like, oh like you know, you were jealous of your husband that he was uh, sh- stupping Yvette. That's why you killed him too. She's like, "Yeah, yeah, I did kill Yvette. I I hated her so much. It the flames, the flames over my." Face. <laughs> I love this scene where they're trying to count how many shots are left in the gun. Oh my god, fan! That's that is good classic, like cornball comedy though. It's just like no, 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 no. One at Mister Body. Two for the chandelier, two at the lounge door, and one for the singing telegram. That's not six. One plus two plus two plus one. Uh-uh. There was only one shot that got the chandelier. That's one plus two plus one plus one. Well, even if you were right, that would be one plus one plus two plus one, not one plus two plus one plus one. Okay, fine. <laughs> the point is, there's one bullet left in this gun. <laughs> like, just such a good... That's such, like, a good 1950s comedy bit, but is still just a classic fucking bit this is like peak 80s humor just looking back at the quotes yeah where it's like (laughs) professor plum you were once a professor of psychology specializing in helping paranoid and homicidal lunatics suffering from delusions of grandeur yes but now i work for the united nations so your work hasn't changed (laughs) (laughs) in all of the endings too they mention that communism was a red herring yeah all right (laughs) I also love Tim Curry's, like, at the start of the evening, Yvette was here by herself waiting to offer you a glass of champagne. I was in the hall. I know, because I was there. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Is everything all right? Yep, two two corpses. Everything's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, the other... Miss Miss Peacock's going to pee, uh, or going to the girls' room. Oh, is there a little girls' room in the hall? Wee wee, madame. And then Miss Peacock (laughs) goes, no, I just want to power under my nose. Oh my god! Or like when they when they have the bodies and they're trying to put them in the chairs, 
<laughs> and the, or like on the love seat. Hmm. And they're like, well, if we lay him back, like the knife's gonna go in further to the back. Well, then let's just lay him over the edge and like fumbling with the fucking bodies <laughs> the whole time. I also love yeah. um, <laughs> when they're like, "Who's on the phone? Why are you receiving calls from J. Edgar Hoover?" That's right, the federal, the head of the federal bureau of investigation. Why is J. Edgar Hoover on your phone? I don't know. He's on everybody else's. Why shouldn't he yeah. be on mine? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, uh, I I feel like I need to watch more like Tim Curry movies. Has he yeah, done like much? Like, I have seen that one, <laughs> but like like full blood like comedies. Has he done many others? Because like he's so funny in this movie. Mm-hmm. He is, but I feel like he normally plays like I feel like he's normally very much kind of a character actor. Like he's not yeah. normally the star of a movie. Um, I guess it depends on who you're rooting for in it. <laughs> well, I the, mean, okay. The like clown? It, but even then, technically is the clown. That was a like a made-for-TV movie, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't like he starred in like this blockbuster comedy or this blockbuster yeah. movie. Um, or, I mean, even in like Rocky or Picture Show, you know, he's, he's in like makeup and everything. Yeah. Yeah, but I feel like that's like his biggest... That's obviously like his biggest thing, but I don't. I when I think of the stuff he's done, I think of mostly either it's all between like voiceover work because that's what he's done for the past like twenty something years. Nigel Thornberry. Um, I mean, he's done <laughs> just a bunch of other I stuff outside lot, of but... that too. But like, I think of a, a lot of that. I mean, realistically, I'm looking at his IMDb page. He's been doing voiceover work since. Like the early nineties, like, like nineteen ninety one. Yeah. Wow. He was Darth Sidious in the Clone Wars. Yep. He was in. I know he did some voices. He was actually uh, interesting. Fun fact. Let's just uh, tie this all back to Batman because that's what we do here. Um, he was supposed to be the original voice of the Joker in Batman the Animated Series. Um, hmm. Interesting. There's a lot. There's a couple different, like stories floating around as to why he he didn't end up doing it uh there one being that his uh his voice was deemed too scary they showed uh <laughs> the head of the network showed this the show to his son with tim curry voicing the joker and that uh his son was too scared of too afraid of him so they were like okay that's it's too much Another another rumor that went around was that uh, he did the voice, but it it hurt his like vocal cords too much, so he couldn't actually do like several takes for a full episode. So they didn't, um, you know, he didn't do the the part full on. Um, but it is kind of an interesting thing that that's kind of how that played out. He could have could have been the voice of. Of the Joker instead of uh, Mark Hamill, which ended up playing the character from 1992 to, like, I think he's still Today, doing it. Today, probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've always wondered that, like, how uh, like how voice actors, like, do their work for so long. Like, I feel like they have to, like either find a voice that doesn't harm your your throat that much or like or do you just deal with it and like honey tea and take care of it later um i mean i guess it probably de- depends i mean realistically if you're if you're coming up with a character's voice you don't want it to be something that you can't do for an extended time like, i feel like if you're you know you're committing or you're auditioning for something you make sure whatever you're doing is something you can do for you know ever day in day out it is crazy that that's i mean from like 1990 i mean hell even like heck this has him being a voice in fantastic max and night starting in 1988 so i mean he kind of transitioned into doing like animated animated voiceover work in the in the late 80s like that's insane Especially because if you played a lot of his stuff, you might not even realize that it's Tim Curry. Well, when Cam was like, Nigel Thornberry, I was like, really? Yeah. Oh, you didn't know that? No. Yeah. 
that's like one of his big that's like his big one um i said he's done just he's done stuff on everything like most animated shows he's done some sort of voice for but it is crazy to me that he really never became like a like a star in multiple comedies like watch after watching this movie i was like damn like i need to watch some more because it you know it's it's got a little bit of everything. It's got like some wit, some like lines. It's got a lot of uh, like uh, physical comedy, slapstick. Uh, so I was like, man, I, I should check this out. And uh, just, I guess I, I guess I won't really There aren't really, really any to. other options yeah. out there. Yeah. Unless you want to watch it again. <laughs> Were you guys kind of like pleasantly surprised or was it like, eh, you know, this is kind of what I expected because Ben, Ben kind of, I was gonna say Ben kind of pitched it as like a cult classic to me a little bit. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, I think that's accurate. I think that it's very. I think it's very okay. Um, like I think so. I think when you think of board game movies, it does like those are usually do- absolute dog shit. Um, Name but this one's one. fine. I mean, this one's all right. It's it's entertaining. Like it's not it's not super good, but it's like okay. But it's also I'm not to think of bad other either. What other board game movies are there? Just uh, Battleship, I think. There is Battleship. Um, I'm trying to. Th- I, I mean, think there J- might be others, but I I would say Jumanji, but there's not like it wasn't based off a board game. I think they made no. the board uh, game after. Yes, that's true. Looks like there was also it's not a board game. There was a Dungeons and Dragons movie. Well, yeah, uh, I knew that. Yeah, I mean, I'm mostly thinking of Battleship, I guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> you literally Huge said sample size. Usually board, usually board game movies are dog shit, and I'm like, this is like one of the only ones I can think of that even exists. Oh, so hey, it's pretty like surprising. Candyland, there's Candyland, the Great Lollipop Adventure. Is that like animated or? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking now like we're another just grasping it. There's a game. There's a game about the game about Go. What? Uh, there's a game called. There's a movie called World Wars, but it, it's like surrounded by Scrabble. I would be interested to like what other movie or what other game you could make into a movie. Monopoly. It's like a say. Wolf of Wall Street movie, but it's like really dark about the the world of corporate real estate. Um, you know, I think especially, like, I feel like in the past, like, 10 years, we've kind of entered a board game renaissance. There's so many board games out there that I feel like you could easily make any of the new ones. But oh, some I mean, of like them are... Betrayal. But that one's, like, Betrayal. based off of, like, other... I mean, IPs. it's based off of some lore, I guess. Like, Eldritch Horror is based off of Eldritch Lore. Um, but, like, Betrayal is, is like, it's kind of just, like... Uh, like the haunting of Hill House, or like those sort of movies where it's it's got yeah, it's got themes and from from there, but um, yeah, I think I think realistically, I'm I'm talking like classic board. What classic board games you could classic board games? Don't uh, break okay, the ice. Let's see, we got Clue, we got Monopoly. <laughs> Don't wait, Daddy. That's an old one. Uh, probably make that a movie. <laughs> I was gonna say Operation is one. Uh, cooties. Uh, <laughs> uh mousetrap I, is mousetrap there, i is there not a mousetrap movie i feel like they no you're talk thinking about of mouse it. hunt <laughs> or and rat that race is a movie that well rat race isn't about actual rats I know. I know. um <laughs> but mouse hunt is about uh them trying to catch them who's in that movie um oh my god it's gonna drive me nuts now uh Candyland. nathan lane Nathan Lane's in it, and I can't remember who else is in that movie. Shoots and uh, Ladders. But it was written by... Oh, my God. I, I listened to a Guess podcast who? with the guy who wrote that movie. Um, Does Ouija count? I mean, I saw that on lists. I think it counts. Um, And then I, I see Jumanji came out the same time as the board game, actually. Oh, the game of life. Obviously, the game of life. That one I feel like is so easy. I feel like I feel like that movie would be rather boring. Well, I feel like you go kind of meta with it 
and some dude's having all his like choices. He's like, man, this is really boring. And then it's kind of like, oh yeah, it's all determined by this thing. And like other people just, you know, yeah. you can so literally the, change the, the cards Tru- you're dealt. The Truman Show. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 I mean, kind of, but uh, yeah, Monopoly. Um, Risk. Does Risk count? I mean, that's basically Battleship with like a bunch of extra steps. You know, it's really hard to make a movie based off of a resource management game, and all of these <laughs> sound like resource management games. They are all, I all are. Ooh, Pandemic. That would be a fun one. Oh my god. Oh, too soon. <laughs> yeah. Too soon. See the issue. The issue I feel like is, and maybe this is just all board game based movies that I would be thinking of. Is like you can go with like the general concept of like. Uh, you know, like Monopoly or or Life or whatever, where it's like, oh yeah, like you know, you're just making life choices or you're like selling real estate, but then you have to like deviate from the game <laughs> fairly quickly. Like you use it as like yeah. a setup, and then it goes like you know, like Life, for instance, like Cam, you said you it's like super meta or something, where it's like you know maybe you mm-hmm. unlock the ability to to spin and kind of like uh, kind of like Free Guy, if you guys have seen yes, that one. That's what I was thinking. Uh, yeah, I mean, I get that. Uh, it is interesting how closely, sorry, or sorry, not sorry, um, (laughs) looking at board games, um, how, how strictly Clue sticks to the source material of the board game, (laughs) where it has the characters and the different weapons and the different, uh, rooms, and they're like, we have to figure out which room Mr. Body was killed in and with what weapon and who did it. It's like, that's literally the game. Well, and it's also just, just, like, the secret passages that connect which room to which room is also, like... Yeah. I feel like that's also straight out of the... Yeah. It is, yeah. It is straight no, out of the game. No, I, I... To answer your original question of... of you know, Scattergories? Of how I, <laughs> how I kind of... My reaction to it or what I was thinking. I was honestly shocked how well they made this weird comedy whodunit hybrid like honestly the entire time i I was trying to figure out who the killer was and i kept picking up on the little clues but it was like oh this just leads it to be like it could be any of them there really isn't like a oh this is who it is or you know there was no real overwhelming kind of thing which made the ending of you know it being kind of everyone made sense but yeah, I, I honestly was really impressed at the way that they were able to intertwine this weird slapsticky vaudeville comedy and intertwine it with this who done it mystery and it actually work. Because when you when you hear that phrase together at a pitch meeting, so imagine a imagine a Charlie Chaplin comedy mixed with a who done it mystery. You'd get fucking laughed at. Yeah. No one's going to go, yeah, let's make that movie. And yet they did. And it's good. I feel like the whodunit part is a little bit weak. Like, because of the fact that they had multiple endings, I feel like the lead up to it was a little weak, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like, okay, but like, there's no, I mean, other than like her saying that, I feel like there's not a ton of evidence throughout the movie to suggest who did it. Because they left it open ended. I mean, I that's kind of yeah. in the spirit of the game, and I get that, but I do feel like the Who Done It angle is a little weak. I'm just glad they didn't do the fucking cop out of oh the butler did it. Yes. Well, and in the one, the, the only one, well, the only one where the butler did do it, he wasn't actually the butler though. He was actually yeah. uh, the blackmailer the whole time. <laughs> And he had which killed is, his butler. Which is a line I love at the beginning of the movie when Colonel Mustard asks him what he does. He's like, I'm the butler. Oh, so what do you do? Yeah. I buttle. I buttle. <laughs> <laughs> three of us had not seen this film, so you're going to get three fresh ratings on Clue. Cameron, kick it off. All right. Uh, I'm going to give this Corn Fest a six out of ten. I think it's all right. Uh, the, I wish it was a little more mystery forward. I mean, it technically is, but I do think that like none of the stuff really matters as much. And because of the fact that they had multiple endings, they kind of had to do it that way. 
Um, but the movie was so short anyway. I feel like they could have just gotten away with like doing one really good ending. Um, so that just leaves it as like kind of a comedy um, with a little whodunit on the side, I guess. And the comedy was fine. I mean, it was campy, you know, humor. Um, I think it's okay. So I'm going to, I like I said, I give it a 6 out of 10. I am kind of torn on this one. I think I'm going to give it like a 6.5. I'm torn between a 6 and a 7. Look, is this an end-all, be-all, like, have-to-watch movie? No. Uh, but if you're a fan of kind of campy comedy, then this is right up your alley. It's got a lot of... Honestly, this movie feels like... It feels very Mel Brooksy to me. Yeah. Like, it does feel like a Mel Brooks murder mystery movie, uh, where it's just got, like, a bunch of gags that don't make sense, but you still laugh at them. You know, uh, the cop walks in, and, you know, they're making out with the dead bodies. He walks into the other one, and the guy's holding a bottle... He's like, oh, he's dead drunk. Oh, yeah, well, we'll make sure he's not leaving here. And he's he's not leaving here by himself, that's for sure. Just like, okay, just stuff that is so, it's clever and also stupid at the same time. Uh, I think Conan O'Brien said that it was the thing he strived for, to be smart and stupid at the exact same moments. And I think this movie does that, where, like, it's, the way that they do it is so smart, but also you go, God, that is so dumb that it's really quite clever. Um, the whodunit part. Yes. I think if they just did one ending, they could have kind of played the whodunit a little bit more, but also for the fact that like as a marketing strategy to do three different endings is really, it's a pretty cool idea, especially like we said, pre-internet where like you can't just go and, and look up, oh, what's the other ending? Or you can't just wait a couple weeks or a couple months to watch the other endings on YouTube. Like, you actually just have to go see what the other endings were. I thought it was a really cool idea. It's not a movie that I'm going to tell anyone that, like, you haven't seen it? Oh, my God, you have to watch this. Uh, But it is one that I would say if I found out, like, you like that kind of campy movie and you hadn't seen it, then check it out. Yeah, six and a half out of ten clue i don't know like i enjoyed it it was a bit long for my taste i will say the the shtick is funny kind of until it's not and it kind of like overstays its welcome a little bit um i do really enjoy a lot of the humor like uh there's some good like just goofy jokes or like uh they'll put people in a scenario where there's like a joke waiting to happen I do like the corny humor and like the very 80s uh, feel it gives me. It kind of reminds me of, you know, Caddyshack or like Airplane or those sort of uh, movies. And I mean, seeing that the the story is by John Landis definitely makes sense. Um, You know, I'm going to be right there with you guys. I think a six is pretty adequate for this film. Like it's not it's not going to blow you away. But it's going to like, you know, it's going to be a fun evening. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to rate and subscribe. Check us out on Instagram at Cocktails and Classics Pod. And hit up those Drizzling Casker links below. Let us know what you think of your Colonel Mustard. Check us out next week as we review another classic film. And as always, watch responsibly. <laughs>